There's a sort of prevalent mindset around the conversation about any piece of peak media, stuff that's considered to be the best of its field. It's the feeling that the people behind these classics are just so good at their job, they make the creative process look simple, if not completely effortless. In reality, these paragons usually have their masterpiece status in spite of the numerous difficulties that were encountered while making them. Fury Road, A Game of Thrones, Evangelion, One Winged Angel, all of these were made by competent people and all had production struggles that made them just a little bit hellish to work on. The creative process is not, has never been, and never will be a straight shot to the finish line. So, take comfort in the fact that this is also true of one of the most well-regarded animated television shows of the late 90s, Cowboy Bebop. Bebop is famous for managing uniquely sad yet emotionally real sci-fi vibes. A Studio Sunrise production directed by Shinichiro Watanabe, written by Keiko Nobumoto, and scored by Yoko Kano, with additional music from the seatbelts. It's enjoyed critical and audience acclaim, as well as airtime in English-speaking territories for over two decades. But again, production wasn't exactly smooth sailing. The show was actually approved with a toy deal from Bondi, hoping to ride the wave of another big sci-fi series that was about to make a comeback. However, they pulled out of the project when it was clear that the production team's vision was pointedly different than Boy Fight Space Baddies with a cool stick. Meanwhile, internal investors at Sunrise thought the show's darker tone read as pretentious and wouldn't recoup the costs of production. Watanabe is on the record for saying that the show went over budget and would have tanked his career if it had flopped. So, despite the reasonable amount of creative freedom, the unexpected developments during production also meant that the staff was totally walking down the plank. In that regard, it is a miracle that the series turned out so well. Bebop sports impressive emotional range, a solid cast, and consistently strong presentation throughout. The design of the show is exceedingly sharp and unique. Realized by Watanabe's love of multiculturalism, Toshihiro Kawamoto's character design, and a litany of talented background artists. Yoko Kano, while out of her comfort zone at the start of production, created a diverse and memorable soundtrack that actually helped shape important moments of the series. There was actually a real chance of her passing on the job for Bebop, and if that happened, we likely would have never gotten the church window scene at the end of episode 5. It all comes together to make for a television show that is eminently watchable and difficult to put down. Cowboy Bebop is genuine, to the point where most everything about the series has been able to remain fresh and near quarter century removed from its creation. So, you know... What the hell? Still warm. I've been wanting to get to this one for a little while. After years of production troubles and a pandemic delay, the live-action Cowboy Bebop series released in 2021 to a near-universal panning. Like, people were pissed about this show. Most of the initial impressions were focused on the look of the sets and the dialogue being really unpalatable. Which it is. Those two things alone would be enough to turn any classic Bebop fan against the show, and it's not like the tide was ever really in its favor. But even though I'm still being awoken in the middle of the night by thoughts of the blackmail scene, this show's biggest issues are structural. I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like I've had skin in the game for a super long time or anything. Cowboy Bebop was not a formative piece of media for me. I just watched the OG animated series for the first time over the winter, so there will be no accusations of ruined childhoods or ruined adolescenthoods here. Without that baggage, I figure it might be worthwhile to try and meet the show on its own level. While I will be making fun of its more obvious failings from time to time, because I think doing so is very funny, I'll try not to let them overtake this video. We already know that the dialogue is poor and that the show looks cheap as hell. What I'm interested in is looking at its failings and adaptation, as well as scrutinizing its live-action identity. Because, oh my god... Oh my god. Did you really need to off poor Dimitri? It should also go without saying, but I'm going to be spoiling both versions of the show too. And from this moment on, I'm going to be referring to the original animated series as Old Bop, while calling the live action series New Bop, because writing about them in any other way legitimately made the script way too confusing and overly wordy. So, yeah. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> I think it's really interesting how time is one of the key differences between both TV shows. One of the best aspects of Old Bop is how well-paced the whole thing manages to be. Unless it was one of the two-part stories, each individual narrative could only be a 20-minute episode. So when something is being explored, it is precise and efficient. 
The classic example of this is the bell peppers and beef exchange between Spike and Jet in the very first episode. Special bell peppers and beef. A lot is communicated in this two minute exchange. Character dynamics, world building, the momentum of the episode's plot. Again, since there isn't a lot of time to work with, exactly how it is spent ends up being critically important. Not just for pacing reasons, but for first impressions. By comparison, watching Nubop proves to be a challenge at every turn because it just drags. A major contributing factor to this is that each episode ranges between 40 and 50 minutes. Since most of the classic stories were written with a roughly 24 minute runtime in mind, Nubop spends many of its minutes trying to justify its own existence. And How Asteroid Blues, the first story, is adapted manages to be a great example of that. So the bell peppers and beef exchange is clever in that the characters Spike and Jet are only eating bell peppers. There's no beef in the dish because the payout from the bounty the two were after before the events of the episode was drastically diminished due to the damages Spike caused on the job. The duo are poor, they need money to eat, hey that Asimov job looks easy enough, let's go get him. Well, Nubop actually opens on this botched job, and in the 9 minutes it takes to end it becomes painfully clear that the adapted material is just being stretched out. In the aftermath of the botched job, Jet brings up a new daughter character a couple times, gets into an argument about reward money at the police station, and chats with a new cop character for a bit. The main portion of Asteroid Blues really only gets going 25 minutes into the episode, which is longer than the animated version took to begin and end, and these problems only escalate as the episode continues. In Old Bob, Asimov uses an illegal steroid called Red Eye on himself and goes on a killing spree in a bar without getting scratched. In New Bob, he does the same thing, but he also gets shot in the shoulder, which uh, makes this performance enhancing drug look not all that performance enhancing. And honestly, it really feels like this change was made in order to justify the subsequent conversation between Spike and Katarina taking exponentially longer while Asimov fights a nurse to get patched up. This way, we can allude to Spike's past relationships, introduce the third primary character, Faye Valentine, super early, and learn why Katarina is in the situation to begin with, concluded by another action scene, and following that long exchange, eventually build to a climax where everybody gets into a parking lot shootout, where people from Spike's past and organized crime show up to allude to that, and end by adapting the finale of Asteroid Blues, sort of, because there's another scene right after that introduces the main antagonist, as well as the person from Spike's past that the episode has actually already hinted at twice already, I think there might be a problem here. What gets me about this longer runtime is that there is so much more to watch, but so much less to see. We watch the botched job, we get longer conversations, there are more players in the climax, and we end by hinting at something much bigger, but those are not qualities that Asteroid Blues is necessarily enhanced by, so it just kind of transforms it into this big lumbering mess. This is the case for every subsequent episode, albeit in slightly more unique ways. If you haven't written the show yet, then having a longer runtime sounds like a good thing, but in the end it manages to highlight what worked so well about that original 20 minute runtime. Nubop Honest to God reads like it was written for completion, not because the episodes would have been the best versions of themselves if they were this long. It's like one of those English class assignments in high school we all cheated on where we needed to hit a minimum of 500 words. You know, the poison for Cusco, Cusco's poison. This results in multiple sequences that are either excruciatingly slow or painfully fast. I honestly can't pick out a well-paced episode from any of the ten. But stretching out the old Bob stories is not the only writing method here. So in both versions of the show, the immediate goals of Asimov and Katerina within Asteroid Blues are more or less the same. The two are trying to get to Mars, they fail, and their spaceship gets Swiss cheesed by police gunfire. However, despite the post-bar fight conversation between Spike and Katarina being twice as long in New Bop, one key detail was actually left out, and that's the bit where Spike talks about the class disparity that exists on Mars. It must be a great place to live. Sure, if you're rich. At the climax of New Bop episode 1, we also see Spike try to save Katarina because we are told that she reminds him of a woman from his past. This is a big example of what I mean by there being so much less to see. One of the greatest strengths of Old Bob was that the world and characters had enough layers to them so that when something like this happened, everything was emotionally complex yet ambiguous to the point where you could just sit with it for a minute. Not a new Bop, not only do we know why everyone is doing what they are doing, it is pointedly less complex. The political circumstances behind some of these moments and the world at large are now almost completely interpersonal. 
I'm not saying that can't make for compelling writing, that wasn't even the case for every great meditative moment in Old Bop, but if that was the choice, then I don't think backgrounding the political aspects of the series was the right call, because as a consequence, the world and the characters of New Bop are far less interesting. Now Katarina is in this situation because of her shitty dad, whom Spike has no familiarity with. So when Spike very vocally tries to save her before she gets shot, it is miles less engaging than having her solemnly accept that she'll just never make it to Mars. Adios. Turning the gray into black and white is such a strange choice considering how much Old Bop thrived on emotional and political complexity. It's one of the reasons why Old Bop remains so compelling after all this time. The reason behind the Astral Gate incident, Faye's crushing debt, the entire nature of being a bounty hunter, these are aspects that just helped everything feel more well realized. If there is a major problem in the world of Nubop, it is never a problem that has its roots in the world's issues. Episode 5 demonstrates how Jet Black's story gets simplified particularly badly, and I'm not talking about his new daughter character either. Both versions of Jet are ex-members of the ISSP, the police organization in this universe. But in Nubop, he didn't leave because of the overwhelming corruption that was present in the institution, he isn't even the only good cop in the police force anymore. Been dragging him for months trying to build a case. It was because one bad cop made him the fall guy during a case where Jet almost found him out. But by the end of the episode, the one bad cop is disposed of, and the other guy Jet knows in the ISSP does him a solid. Once again, we're given a moment that we are expected to ruminate on, but it pales in comparison to the story it's adapting, or anything else Jet had going on in Old Bop, because it's simple to the point where it's not remotely interesting to think about. I mean, I guess you could think, wow, that guy really sucked, but... Nothing about the corruption that exists within police institutions is considered, because in the world of Nubop, it all begins and ends with one bad guy. This extends to other antagonists in the series, too. The antagonist of New Bop Episode 2 is the Teddy Bomber, who in his Old Bop episode is constantly cut off or undermined, because the real focus of the episode is Spike getting into a cowboy off with Cowboy Andy. That isn't to say that the Bomber lacks substance, though. Him never getting the word out on his motives is the whole point. It's a funny joke. The absurdity of the cowboy off and how much it ends up escalating is what makes Episode 22 of Old Bop one of my personal favorites. But that doesn't mean that the bomber lacks substance. It's there, it's just stated very briefly so it can get sidelined again. It's a smart way to make one of the show's most politically motivated antagonists into a butt monkey. All of that is gone in New Bop, and I'm not talking about Cowboy Funk not getting adapted. I actually think that Cowboy Andy being an easter egg on the Big Shot leaderboard is a really cute touch. Teddy Bomber is now just a crazy guy who wants to make big explosion because he is crazy. His manifesto is no longer so extensive even a TV show can't cover it all. It's just a mostly incomprehensible puzzle about how cool he thinks explosions are. Piece of shit just likes to watch them burn. Episode 6 changes the Dr. Londis storyline from having anything to do with itself into a time loop thriller where Spike is being hunted down by Vicious. What's confusing to me is that even though the priorities of the episode are so different, some of the cultish imagery of Dr. Londis' operation remains, even though Nubop has no intention of discussing cults in any capacity. It's just there so the attempt can be made to make the incredibly weak main villain look any degree of intimidating. Or, I guess, vicious. So I guess we need to talk about vicious. I think I need to take a step back before I get into this next bit. So far we've gotten into some of the stuff that's been added to the classic Bebop stories, as well as the amount everything has been simplified and depoliticized. The Syndicate plotline is arguably the thing that's been worked on the most, which I think may have been a route that was taken in order to give the series more of a clear through line, but uh… Okay. So Vicious is the biggest foil to Spike in both shows. A man from his past in organized crime, and veteran of war in Old Bop, He's a major player in the most important Spike-centric stories. However, in Old Bop, he only appears in 5 out of the 26 episodes. So, a tremendous amount of restraint is exercised in not expanding on the whole deal with Vicious and the crime syndicate to an overwhelming degree. The choice to leave most of it as an obscured set of flashbacks makes less more in this case. Since Spike's story has technically already happened and most of the series is episodic, it makes sense to not give Vicious or the syndicate buckets of lore. But for whatever reason, Vicious goes from being a character you only saw a glimpse of every once in a while, to constant presence whose every life event you see go down from episode 2 onward. I can understand the rationale behind this, I guess. Even into the age of streaming, there have been a number of extremely popular prestige television shows that do not follow Cowboy Bebop's largely episodic format. 
However, the throughlining of the Syndicate plotline has many of the same problems that the adaptation of Asteroid Blues suffered, multiplied tenfold. It was not designed to be present in nine episodes of television, let alone nine 40-minute episodes. So the decision was made to expand on the presence of things that already existed. Again, it reads like we're writing for a passing grade here. Anna's convenience store becomes this bar that Syndicate members frequent. I'm sure this sounds like semantics, and it's not too big of a deal at first. The bar looks kind of neat, and at the beginning it's kind of nice to be in. But because this storyline is so present, we naturally see this bar a lot more too. And it makes the world feel really small. One of the appeals of Old Bop is that it felt like it could take you anywhere because nothing stayed in one place for too long. Maybe the crew would circle back to one location a couple times, but it was never a hard and fast rule that they had to. This gave the series room to mess around with its settings as much as it used them for serious drama. The amount of variety and mileage they got out of their settings, especially the Bebop ship, is proof of that. New Bop is chained to the bar. I'm not sure if it was a resource-driven choice or if it's just a natural consequence that comes from ballooning the storyline, but if we're getting to the point where we use the setting to show the backstory of the Rose from episode 1, then it signals that there was really not a lot to work with. Not to mention that this is all in addition to the medium of live action having less potential for visual diversity. So what begins as a neat alternative to Anna's convenience store becomes wildly overexposed. And in this storyline, Vicious is probably the most infamous example of this. He appears in every episode of Noobop, totally stripping away any sort of mystery that surrounded him, which predictably leads to some massive issues. For one, translating the character design directly to live action highlights why animation is such a versatile tool for depicting a villain like this. He goes from this sinister Captain Harlock to looking like your devil. Then there's how he interacts with every character around him. We never saw a ton of Vicious's syndicate politicking in Old Bop, but introducing him with an assassination signaled that his methods were dangerous and unorthodox. Despite that, he never left any of the stories he appeared in unscathed. He regularly got injured and lost men along the way, which showed how destructive his actions were. The problem in giving him more screen time, though, is that outside of all of the syndicate business, Vicious, the guy, was not an insanely flexible character. He showed disregard for the syndicate heads and their way of doing things, and had something going on with Spike in the flashbacks. But if you want to show him working within the syndicate for multiple consecutive episodes, there isn't a ton to work with. And again, this was by design. So the solution is to have Newbot Vicious giving... That inbred animal insulted me, insulted the syndicate. I don't know, Tom Hiddleston's Loki energy. Which, in concept, I can somewhat understand why that may have been easier to work with if we are to give him more screen time, but uh, there's another problem. Noobop Vicious Fuck! is really bad at his job. Throughout his extended screen time, he regularly gets humiliated or is humiliating himself or just sucks. It happens in the present day and in the extended flashback. Characters point out how lame he is, and he hits wall after embarrassing wall. And yet, because we need to hype up Ballad of Fallen Angels for the season finale, sort of, the show also regularly tells us how good he is at killing. A point is made over halfway through the show that Vicious would chase Spike to the ends of the galaxy to kill him, which ends up meshing really poorly because Spike had already pulled one over on him three episodes into the ten episode season. Now, something about Vicious in Old Bop is that he always managed to get away. It made him elusive, like Spike was always on the cusp of closing an old chapter of his life. At the end of Noobop episode 3, Spike calls Vicious on the phone, spooks him a little, fires a sniper rifle at his limousine, cuts his face, and walks away all cool-like while Vicious screams his head off. Not only did Spike hold the advantage in the entire situation, he won. So three episodes later, when Spike is in time loop land running from Vicious, it just reads as silly. Like, is this the guy haunting your dreams, Spike? I don't know if he'd make it through the Home Alone house. Meanwhile, when neither of those things are happening, we get to watch Vicious do small errands, make plans, see the bat spike, everything short of watching him do his laundry. So in Noobop, he has to be Vicious, the relentless killer that can and will chase you to the ends of the galaxy, Vicious, the incompetent screw-up that needs to work hard to overcome his obstacles, and Vicious, methodical tactician that navigates his workplace politics and does his errands like a good boy at the same time. And because he has to be all of these things, it pulls him apart at the seams. This character is just not designed to fulfill all of these roles, and as a result, he's a poor antagonist. 
This extends to how Julia is used too. Both versions of the character are caught up in syndicate business, but unlike Old Bop, where she was just another person involved in this world of organized crime, here she is regularly depowered by Vicious and placed in harrowing circumstances that she must survive, which I suppose makes her end of season heel turn have maximum impact, but... Well, it's different. The whole climax is particularly strange. There's the more obvious shortcomings. Trying to recreate bits of Ballad of Fallen Angels displays how not playing to your medium's strengths weakens the final product. And then there's the more egregious structural problems. At this point in the series, both the overall syndicate plotline and a separate plotline involving Jet's now kidnapped daughter essentially causes the Battle of the Church to happen twice. Once, when Spike and Jet are captured halfway through the episode, taken there and tortured, and once Faye breaks them out, Spike goes back in for the shot-by-shot -shot adaptation. Then Julia shows up to take Vicious's role as the main antagonist, we recreate Spike falling out of the window, and conclude with original content for the last five minutes of the season. It's as if the climax is caught between two worlds, and it speaks to what the show fell short on the most. Some of the most positive reviews I read about Noobop asserted that this version of the series was perfectly adequate if you decouple the fact that it shared its name with another thing. I went in curious if I could actually do that, feeling like I couldn't, and learned that it didn't matter how I felt because this show was caught between homage and originality from moment one. Now, some of it is cute. Again, the Cowboy Andy leaderboard moment was fine, but so much of it is just cloying and it feels implemented a lot more... Uh, literally, than Old Bop did it. Maybe the most infamous moment is in episode 10, when Faye directly quotes the iconic episode outro line during a heated argument. I won't carry that weight. Now, Old Bop wasn't above being self-referential, but it kinda did so knowingly. Like, you've already seen this thing, so it knows you're in on the joke. See you, space cowboy. So, referencing this quote in the middle of one of the more bleak arguments the crew has just makes the whole exchange a bit... shit. Like, am I supposed to buy into this tension or go, whoa dude, the lion? Trying to do both in a scene with this mood is a balancing act in the best of circumstances. So I just can't understand why they went with that. The are you living in the real world quote from knocking on heaven's door is used at the end of New Bop episode six, which hey, slots in perfectly with Spike literally not living in the real world for like three quarters of that episode. It stands in stark contrast to that quote being used to tie into Spike's actual character and the themes of, of the series. Well, that's not fair, I guess they tried in episode six. When they're not super literal, some of these homages feel like they exist just because Old Bop had them. The most damning one for me is Ask DNA playing in New Bop episode three to the backdrop of Spike and Jet just walking across a room. When the song played in the opening credits of Knockin' on Heaven's Door, the direction was so deliberate it was synced to the animation. It didn't necessarily have to be the same here, but literally any direction would have made it a choice that felt considered outside of, it's the song, from that movie, of that show I watched, I like that show. You cannot decouple Old Bop from New Bop because New Bop actively does not want you to. This results in the original content occasionally getting suffocated by what feels like the need to call back to Old Bop. However, I need to make it clear that while I found lots of the original content ill-considered or baffling or genuinely pointless, I did not dislike all of it. Noobop very, very occasionally shows signs of being a unique version of the series that could have worked. I think Faye getting an engineer girlfriend in episode 6 could have potentially led to a unique dynamic that her animated counterpart never had, but that engineer leaves the show in the same episode she's introduced in. So the first character Faye lets her guard down around disappears into the void, and in the following episode that explores more of her past, Spike and Jet are barely involved. Which is literally the inverse of Speak Like a Child. That episode worked because the rest of the Bebop crew had to find all of the tech that would let them watch a VHS tape that got delivered to them, which turned out to be a home movie Faye made when she was young. Faye just getting the tape herself in a brand new scenario without any help from the main cast makes the Bebop crew feel less like a unit and like they don't really have a bond. And if that was in fact the intent, then why bother recreating Speak Like a Child's big emotional moment? 
That was a late game scene in Old Bop. The crew had spent a large chunk of the series together at that point. So even though Faye was not present in getting the tech to watch the tape, it would still make sense that they were all affected by it. It's the slam dunk for that episode, and it's what makes Faye my personal favorite character in the series. If I'm being generous, by the end of episode 7 of New Bop, Spike, Faye, and Jet have had like two, maybe three moments. And I say maybe because Spike wasn't even there for one of them. So the big emotional catharsis just doesn't hit the way it should. And yeah, this extends to the very end of the season as well. The emotional distress the show goes for when the crew truly disbands not only doesn't work because we aren't as invested, it's because the sequence of events went original content, homage, original content, homage, original content, homage, original content, the end. This problem isn't quite as dire in the rest of the series as it is in the climax, but I believe it speaks to a larger issue with the show itself. Because there doesn't seem to have been as clear of a picture on when homage is supposed to end and originality is supposed to begin, it's like the new material and the old bop stories are fighting for dominance the whole time, which really gives off the vibe of an identity crisis. The show does not know whether to have a different take on the old bop material, whether to remake it shot for shot, or to just do something completely unrelated. So when you reach the end of the season, there is no forward momentum pulling you along to a hypothetical season 2, just relief that at long last it's over. I could get more into the weeds on this, but I feel like I've made my case, and creating a more exhaustive list of grievances would just get gratuitous at some point. I need to make it clear that I don't think any of the main cast are necessarily bad actors or that the place the story might have gone in a theoretical continuation is completely without merit. There were just so many misses throughout the whole show I got tired of thinking about it, and I don't want to write about it anymore. I was checked out of the show by episode 3 and really done with it by episode 7. And like I said at the start, I haven't even been invested in this franchise for a terribly long time. Which to wrap things up, let me talk about the fan response real quick. In the weeks following Noobop's release, I saw a lot of hardcore fans, both in various comment sections and social media posts, gesture wildly at Netflix, the company, for the show's failure, as if it had sprouted arms and taken a hammer to Cowboy Bebop's integrity. Now, there are tons of legitimate reasons to hate Netflix, but to flatten the whole conversation about the show's one failings around the personification of a media corporation feels a bit too essentialist to me, because honestly, the thing that held the show back the most might have been the fact that it was called Cowboy Bebop, if that one interview with the showrunner is anything to go by anyway. There's a whole other conversation to be had about the absolute state of current pop media, but I think there's something about the visceral reaction that fandom has about remakes and reimaginings that it could benefit from outgrowing, or at the very least, interrogating. I've said this before, but I think it's more important to scrutinize the practice on a case-by-case -case basis, and there is value in not simply condemning the practice of remaking because the original version of a property may have been iconic to you. Book to movie, movie to stage show, album to stage show, animation to various live-action mediums, video game to anime series. If we forego the notion of everything having to be one-to-one, -one, then conceptually, most entertainment mediums probably have at least something in their toolkit that could create at least a mildly compelling version of a piece of beloved media. The issues that show up in adaptation are not the abstract concept of a media production company or any nebulous aggressor trying to bring shame upon the name of your favorite thing. What matters is whether or not the people working on any given project have the skills or are under the circumstances necessary to realize an effective television show, movie, game, whatever, in the medium they're working in. Considering that the most memorable thing about Nubop is the series of Seinfeld edits that circulated around the time of release. She's high. <laughs> she's bags in her eyes. Right. I think it's safe to say that this case was simply a good clean miss. It happens. It sucks, but it happens. For me, the existence of Nubop didn't dampen Old Bop as much as it demanded I question what worked so well about it. Even outside of writing this video, I found accounts of people discovering the franchise through New Bop deciding to check out the original series because of it, and loving it. So whether this series worked for someone or not, even if the reverence for and simplifying of the old bop material got in the way of some genuinely good original ideas that may have been more worthwhile to focus on, and although live action as a medium was not used as effectively as it could have been, new bop still had a little utility in the end, even if I can't recommend it somewhat in jest like I did with Robin Hood. And considering that Shinichiro Watanabe himself said he couldn't watch past the first 10 minutes, 
we can infer that the perceived legacy of Old Bop will be just fine. So have no fear, hardcore fans. This reimagining may have been a flop, but we're good. So in conclusion, I like the dog better in the first one. We'll see you again, huh? somewhere. It's over?